self-storage owner or operator. Looking for service providers to help at your facility? Well, the Storage Business Owners Alliance, also known as the SBOA, has you covered. The SBOA is the premier online hub for connecting self-storage owners and operators to industry-leading products and service providers. We provide one-stop shopping for your business with exclusive offers to save time and money. At the SBOA, we believe by coming together, we help owners and operators grow revenue, gain purchasing power, reduce expenses, improve efficiencies, and increase profitability. We also offer many resources such as our conferences and self storage unlock webinars to help self storage owners and operators gain the knowledge needed to become more competitive in the industry. To become an SBOA member or to find out more information, please visit www.thesboa.com today. We can't wait for you to join the Alliance. Good afternoon and happy Thursday, Self Storage Industry. Thank you again for joining us for another episode of Self Storage Unlocked. Today's episode is called Don't Leave Money on the Table, How to Maximize Your Revenue Management Strategy. This is a really important topic, and we are so happy that you are here joining us. Please drop us uh, your name and where you're from in the chat. And also, we're going to try something new today. Um, if you could drop in your LinkedIn link, say that three times fast, LinkedIn link in the chat, we want you to be able to connect with one another on LinkedIn. Um, and it'd be a really easy way to do so by putting your link in there. So before I introduce my guests today, my panelists, my rock star experts in the industry, I want to go over a couple quick housekeeping items with you. Again, utilize that chat area. That's how you can communicate with us. Please ask questions live to the experts while they're here with us today. Um, and then also on the right-hand toolbar, you'll see a poll section. We have a ton of poll questions that we're asking today. And it's really just for us to get to know you better um, and be able to help you with your business, uh, with operational efficiencies and resources that we can provide from the connections that we know, because we've been around doing this now for almost 25 years. Uh, and when I say we, I mean the SBOA. So please drop us that information, answer those polls. And we're going to leave this platform open for 30 minutes after the closing of the event at 3 p.m., we encourage you to visit the expo hall so you can connect with our sponsors of today's event. Um, and those sponsors are Call Potential and Store Track. And before we get started, I would like to share just a couple quick things with you from Store Track and Call Potential. Store Track is the leading provider of market data to the self storage industry worldwide, offering solutions to owners operators, developers, and investors with crucial data needed to make important day-to-day -day decisions in self-storage. StoreTrack for Owners and Operators offers current competitive rate data, historical rates and trends, inventory and supply change, price volatility, marketing information, and scheduled reports. StoreTrack for Brokers, Developers, and Investors offers supply data, competition analysis, historical rate trends, inventory insights, demographic data, and plan developments. To learn more, please visit www.storetrack.com. For pricing, please contact Jody Burks, Business Development Manager of StoreTrack, by email jody at storetrack.com or 727-222-5774. Okay, so now that we've officially started doing full automated unmanned management uh, all the way across the board, we now have 60 some odd facilities here in the last year and a half. We'll be at 100 by the end of the year. The only way that we can run those facilities uh, is through our call centers. We built our own in-house call center. You know, it does all outbound, inbound, and literally the only thing we can use is call potential. It's fantastic. Uh, it's the whole crux of our business. Without it, we would not be able to take payments and have all this management, rent units through multiple softwares. Honest to God, without it, I really don't know what we would do with it. So we're uh, we're very appreciative about it. That's for sure.
All right, everyone. Sorry for that slight technical delay there. Um, well, we're going to jump in. And again, thank you again to Store Track Call Potential and Gate 5 Self Storage and Citizen Self Storage for being here with us today. So I'm going to bring up my first panelist, Jody Burks from Store Track. Hey, Jody. Hi, Jess. How are you? Good. How are you? Can you see the background? All that money flowing because we're going to be can. talking about money. <laughs> are you paying? That's what you're paying me? Just kidding. It is. I'm going to just make it rain with this stack of business <laughs> cards I have here uh, that I play with when I talk and get fidgety. So, Jody, oh, give the self storage industry uh, a brief background of who you are. Don't tell them how long you've been around in the industry because oh, we're yeah. going. That's going to be a trick question here in a minute. But uh, give us the rundown of what you've been doing in the self storage industry. Okay. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the SBOA webinar today. Um, I have been in the storage industry a while. I'll say that for <laughs> first. Um, I uh, worked uh, for budget self-storage in Florida, uh, and I was the operations manager there with them for several years. Um, they sold off the portfolio uh, a few years ago, and so I landed with StoreTrack. Uh, it's been a very good fit uh, with my self-storage background. Um, started as a manager, so uh, I kind of got to see all the insights all the way through uh, to operations and uh, owning. Actually got to invest uh, in some self-storage properties with my previous owner. So... Um, uh, then StoreTrack, uh, like uh, Jess, gave us a great intro, and we have the self-storage competitive data. And when I was a manager and operations manager, we actually used um, StoreTrack to help us uh, with our revenue management and learning about the competition and, and kind of saving time in the manual process. So that's what I get to bring to the table today. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Jody. And we'll bring you back up in just a few seconds when I have all the speakers gathered together. Next up, I have Max. And Max, I apologize. I don't know how to properly pronounce your last name. So I'll just let you go ahead and introduce yourself. Again, don't tell them how long you've been doing this because that's the trick question we're going to ask here in a little bit. Gotcha. All right. Hey, y'all. I'm Max Volatin. I'm the <laughs> owner and operator of Gate 5 Self Storage in Augusta, Georgia. First and foremost, no, I can't get anybody master's tickets. So I'm going to go ahead and put that out. But I am the proud owner of a single store here in Augusta. Um, it's 36,000 square feet. I'm one mile from Fort Gordon, um, the military base uh, in town. And my facility is a traditional drive up storage facility with some climate control units. Um, I'm a site link user and uh, I just added the no key smart locks to some of my units. And I tell you, I used to tell people that I'm a mom and pop facility until my friend and mentor, um, Jim Mooney, fussed at me and explained um, that I, uh, I didn't build my facility to just ignore um, that I stay up to date with the technology. I have lean sales. I raise my street rates, my tenant rates, and I provide amazing customer service. I take pride in Gate 5, and I've been doing that for quite some time now. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us today, Max, and um, love that you just put the Noki system in. I saw your picture earlier of that on LinkedIn or Facebook. It was one of the two. So uh, good luck with that system and adding that. And you've got some land where you could further develop too, right? That is correct. Yes. Awesome. Well, we'll get you some buildings put up here soon, hopefully. Great. <laughs> thanks, Max. All right. And my last speaker today is Peter. And I'm going to say your last name and hope I get it right. Spickenagel, I believe I'm go. saying it right. right. And uh, Peter, go ahead and tell us what you've been doing in the self-storage industry. Yeah. So I'm an owner operator. We uh, own and manage around 10 locations in three states, uh, but also I'm not huge into tech as well. So I'm with the call potential team on the business development side and uh, very excited to kind of show you what we, we do at our properties and how we approach revenue management. Awesome. Thanks so much, Peter. All right. I'm bringing everybody back up. Okay. So the golden question that we're going to ask today before we really dive into the questions is please put in the chat audience, how many years combined experience you think this panel here today has um, and whoever answers the closest will get a instant Amazon downloadable gift card from us. So, all right, we ready to jump into these questions. Let's do it. Yeah, All absolutely. right. So 
we have a wide variety of audience. Uh, we have people that are brand new into the, uh, into the industry, some that have only been around for a couple of years, some that have been around many, many years, institutional investors, owner operators, et cetera. But for those that are newer, who would like to just explain quickly, what is revenue management? I'll go. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll add if we need to, right? <laughs> um, I think of, uh, I think of revenue management, uh, looking at the fee and the features you offer, your inventory, and consistently adjusting the rates, both street and um, tenant rates, to sort of keep up with the changing times and um, economies. And I think about supply and demand, low supply, high demand. You guys should raise your street rates. Yeah, so we take a look at revenue management as anything that has any impact on revenue whatsoever. That's not just uh, street rates or tenant rates. We're looking at admin fees, tenant insurance, merchandise, ancillary income, uh, anything that generates a dollar. We uh, look at it uh, as revenue management and including specials and how specials affect you, the bottom line as well. So we, we take a very global look at uh, revenue management and not just focus on what traditionally I think a lot of uh, people in the industry look at it as just street rates and uh, tenant rate increases. Uh, we we take more of that uh, global approach to it. Jody, do you say, have anything? Yeah, I would ahead. say the yeah. same thing. A simple, uh, I guess, uh, down to the management level is more about, you know, we talk about optimizing our, our rates just to rent more units. That's part of revenue management. But um, also, I, um, you know, identifying an analysis identifying and analyzing, if I can spit it out here, um, you know, your unit occupancy and the pricing to meet specific revenue goals. And I think that's what Peter was saying. It's not, you say revenue management, it's not just looking at your units or the ancillary items there. You're just, you're, you're driving the revenue and that should match your goals to help, help work towards that goal. Yeah, agreed. So, I mean, obviously, with all of that said, this is a critical component to the business. Anybody want to touch on just how critical and important it is to have a strategy and system in place? Yeah, I think you, ha you have to look at it from um, kind of a base level, uh, what you should be doing, uh, what the rest of the industry is doing. And you can start with uh, kind of some basic stuff with street rates and uh, tenant rate increases. And uh, on the street rate side, uh, you can utilize uh, software like StoreTrack to really help you understand what the market is doing. Uh, they do a lot of data scraping of your competitors, a lot of market analysts and what uh, you know the trending rate is on a 10 by 10. And it gives you a lot of insight uh, to make those operational decisions. And you don't have to follow your competitor. You don't have to be below them. You don't have to be above them. Uh, it all depends on where you're at occupancy wise and uh, how you make those decisions. But on a very base level, come up with a strategy on how you then raise your rents or lower your rents based off occupancy and other uh, economic drivers. And then on a tenant rate basis side, uh, decide when and how often you're going to uh, raise their rate. Is it going to be you know nine months after the first move in and then uh, once a year thereafter? Or are you going to get more aggressive every four months? And it doesn't matter if they just moved in or not and or if you've had a tenant for 10 years or not. You can kind of make those decisions on uh, what you want to do. But having that baseline strategy just on those two items, I think, is uh, kind of the first foundational part of a revenue management strategy. Yeah. Anybody else want to chime in? I think that's good. Yeah, Peter pretty much nailed it there, right? Yeah, he, <laughs> he did. Um, so I, I always hate bringing up this topic because I'm sick of talking about this topic, but it is still relevant. COVID-19 and the pandemic. Oh, I thought you were going to say Will Smith smacking uh, Chris Rock. <laughs> no, I love talking <laughs> about uh, that. That topic is way overplayed. <laughs> yes, it's it, no, true too. It is a way overplayed. My gosh, I was like, if I see one more meme on, yeah, or yeah. GIF on you know social media about this, I'm going to lose my marbles. <laughs> but, uh, no, I'm going to go do a another worn out topic, uh, COVID-19. However, it had huge impacts on our industry and, you know, good for us. Actually, it had great impacts on our industry, unlike, you know, food and beverage where it completely wiped them out temporarily for those six weeks of closures. Um, but, you know, it's, it's still here. It's still lingering. So talk to me about how COVID played a role 
in the best practices for revenue management and pricing strategies because it kind of took away, you know, things were shifting more towards contactless uh, environments versus having, you know, somebody standing in your office like we traditionally used to. As a single store operator, when COVID uh, COVID first uh, arrived, I made the decision uh, with my store and call me cold and heartless. I didn't want to sit here and listen to how COVID affected um, this tenant versus, uh, versus that tenant um, because COVID has affected everyone in many different ways. So across the board, I chose um, to give all my tenants 50% off the month of April of 2020. Nice. And um, nice. I, uh, that was my decision. And then when they came back later in the year saying, oh, I'm having issues, I was like, I've already given you a 50% discount. So um, that, uh, that philosophy has... Uh, um, definitely, it paid off in the in the long run, um, and uh, I, I didn't necessarily. Um, I sort of put a pause on raising street rates at, uh, at the time and uh, raising tenant rates at the time, just as a courtesy and knowing that co uh, COVID was affecting the tenants, um, whether they lost their job, they were working from home or still working from home. And, um, but when I'm, uh, uh, my managers thought I was crazy when I made the decision to give a 50% um, discount across the board. And I know a lot of the bigger operators cannot, uh, can't do that in the long run. It's paid off for me. Um, Good. and, uh, just holding off on doing the, uh, raising street rates and tenant rates, but I'm back and uh, things are, quote back to normal so i'm raising street rates tenant rates and um moving forward with it yeah i'd say too once the the pandemic hit it was a uh, constant worry about uh receivables right you were worried that uh, you knew you're not going to get a lot of move-ins you're probably not going to get a lot of move outs uh the the real concern was uh collecting the rent that was owed and uh, one thing that we noticed is uh, the amount of auto pays actually went up uh, for people who signed up for auto pay. And oh, I think people were really determining what's important in their lives and what uh, they need to take care of in kind of this crazy environment that everyone's in. And they prioritize uh, self-storage almost over everything. Uh, I wouldn't say over everything, but it's their stuff. And so we saw that, hey, I want to make sure this bill gets paid. And through, we use call potential at, at all our locations, and that's how we're able to track what's going on. And uh, we were able to still run our properties using call potential because we have a system where we can have our managers work remotely. And it was just a really good system to kind of get us through that very first part of the pandemic. And surprisingly, our, our ARs didn't go up, our auto pays went up, uh, enrollments went up. And then uh, just like, you know, Max, we, we stopped doing rate increases. We uh, kind of were very concerned about that. And then at a certain point, once we felt comfortable, we, we started again. But the pandemic proved to be very uh, good for our industry. And everyone had seen very high occupancies, lengths of stays went up. And uh, because the length of stay went up, you're able to be a little bit more aggressive with uh, those tenant rate uh, increases that maybe you weren't prior to it uh, because you had the occupancy to kind of hold on to it and get those uh, rate increases to, to be more uh, accepted than what they were maybe in the past. Sure. Anything from you, Jody? Well, I'm not in the daily operations anymore, but uh, yeah. just from talking to, you know, clients, um, again, like I said, just making good decisions in your facilities and still looking at the data, uh, you know, to support, uh, you know, waiting a little while for those rent increases or, or changing the rates, uh, you know, obviously paid off, but just exactly like they both said is, you know, then once you figure out, you know, we're leveling off from that pandemic storage is definitely a need uh, with people consolidating, moving in with each other, uh, you know, and um, your units are filling up. So you've got to take an approach to, you know, not just stay the same to go ahead and make those decisions uh, and change those rates based on your, your data and your input. 
Yeah. So let's let's talk about the data side of it for a little bit. And I'm going to refer over to a poll question. So I keep looking to my other screen. So we did ask, how often should you consider changing your rates? The responses were daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, or annually. And from the votes, um, heavy on the quarterly, second two were weekly and annually. Anybody want to touch on what they feel their philosophy is as far as rate increases and raising your rates? Uh, I think it really depends on occupancy um, sure. and uh, making sure that, you know, if you're uh, low occupancy or high occupancy, your your approach to how often you raise, I think, changes and the, the type of raises that you do changes uh, kind of the strategy. Um, you know, if you're uh, having a lot of nutrition, uh, maybe you're going to have different um, frequency of changing your rates than if you have very slow movements, maybe you're a slower property and you only have, you know, 10 movements a month, uh, it could really change your, your strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, I, I follow a lot of the forums out there on social and I see people like, I'm a hundred percent occupied. I'm good to go. And I'm like, mm -mm, no, you're not. <laughs> you got to do something with those rates and get, get some movement going on there. How about, um, we'll, we'll touch on this too. How often, I'll, I'll take this over to you, Max. How often are you looking at your competitors' rates and how are you doing that? Like, what is your process for doing that? Um, I'm, looking, I'm looking at com the competitors' <clears throat> rates um, on a monthly basis. And okay. I am uh, going to uh, online spare, uh, using spare foot just, uh, and then I'm also going um to the actual uh, sites, um, there and they know me uh, well enough. Um, sometimes I send my managers. We just walk in, find out how how are they doing, what size units do they have available or um, not available, and um, we tell and we sort of share information. But I'm trying to do that on a month uh, monthly basis, um, not really to. Uh, not really to um, say, okay, I need to get even with them, but just to ha uh, have a fing uh, finger on the uh, a um, a pulse, just yeah. know what's go uh, go uh, going on. Because there are some facilities I know are much lower than I am. I know I'm, um, some unit sizes I'm the highest, some I'm mi uh, mid range and so I try to use a uh, spare and uh, a spare foot. I go to the sites and um, just uh, find out what's available, what's out there. Peter, how about you? So we look at our, our competitor rates constantly. Uh, I, I wouldn't be able to give you a, an exact number because we, we look at it multiple times, uh, not only during the week, but sometimes during the day. Oh, yeah. Uh, sure. uh, some of the, the publicly traded companies will change pricing uh, quite frequently. Yeah. Uh, just depends Daily. on, <laughs> yeah, just it depends on the market too that we're operating in. Uh, but we use a, a system that uh, data scrapes all our competitors' websites. So we know not only um what the pricing is but what when they changed it uh, and i can look at a bar graph and say hey uh, over a course of you know last 12 weeks uh, where is their pricing gone on 10 by 10s and see if i can find a trend and figure out what's going on and then uh, look at where we're at and make decisions on whether or not we want to be the price leader in the market if we want to kind of be at market or you know maybe we have to cut rates based off of occupancy to drive uh, to drive up um you know, uh, demand or uh, occupancy at that individual property. So for us, it's, it can be, uh, like I said, daily, weekly, monthly. It all, it all really depends on the, the market and the, the property. Sure. Now, Jody, you're not in operations anymore, but you work for StoreTrack, which is not necessarily considered a revenue management software and system. However, it's right. business intelligent that is scraping the data like Peter was just talking about. Can you tell the audience a little bit about what StoreTrack could do for them to help them kind of make that process a little more seamless and not so manual where they're having their managers call, maybe putting it into an Excel sheet? Because I do talk to owner operators that are still doing that. Um, and, and just kind of how that st store track maybe more streamlines it for them in the long sure. run. And that's okay too. I think, you know, some small yeah, operators, totally. you can, as long as you're doing something, some kind of system, um, I guess, uh, you know, the, 
the point we make is is the time of the data collection, I guess. Um, so like you said, if you're only looking at once a month, um, I just know that when I was an operator and I had, you know, a dozen stores and I had my managers doing an Excel spreadsheet uh, and sending me the rates once a month, um, it wasn't enough and all of them would do it at different times. So by the time I got the spreadsheet from them, it's already outdated. I don't know if they collected it last week. I don't know if they used an online rate or if they used a walk-in rate, if they tracked promotion. So that's uh, where I think really StoreTrack can help you because it's consistent, it's accurate data, it's daily uh, pricing data. So uh, we can collect it and aggregate it for you in, in several different forms, whether it's just a kind of an extrait a data feed or we have some visual platforms uh, uh, kind of probably more uh, along the line that Peter talked about and seeing the graphs and the charts and how many rate changes there's been over a certain amount of time so it definitely can help you as we're talking about technology save you time uh, and just gathering all that information. Like you said, we don't make the changes for you, the rate changes or the revenue management, but but we can uh, give you that data. And then, um, uh, like you said, with the timing of, you know, and again, I think the biggest, uh, your location and your demographics, obviously, if you're in a big city like me, Tampa Bay, I mean, uh, and you pointed out too, the REITs are changing prices uh, every day, sometimes more than we see a couple of the REITs that change their prices twice a day, and we're able to track those uh, rates. But if you're not in that high of a demand or your, you know, your demographics, you don't have that much competition, then you don't have to check every day. But I agree that you should have some, you know, some process. Now, give me some suggestions, and this can come from all of you. If, if an owner operator is looking to talk to a company like yours, Jody, or even like a full rev management system, what are some of those key indicators that would tell you that it, you know, because some are rule based, um, you know, can you should be asking them like when they can expect like an ROI from the system. And I mean, some of these systems like Jody, I know for you guys with store track with your monthly subscription, an owner operator really needs to rent like one more unit or two a month and it pays for the system. Right. Right. So, so it's very of, affordable from a operation standpoint. Yeah. Walk, walk me through, like if, if I were a newer owner operator, if I was looking to indoctrinate this into my business and I was going to go talk to a store track or Veritech or any of the other ones out there, what should be some of those key questions I should be asking in the process while I'm vetting them? Um, I guess like we just, we, we touched on a little bit that, you know, some of the, you know, your rates are really determined through, you know, through demand, uh, through competition, um, your location and your demographics, and then your unit types, the unit types that you have and the unit types that your competitors have. So, uh, for example, store track contract the price, contract the promotion, contract the walk-in, um, the change uh, in, I guess, uh, we look at uh, volatility and how often uh, people are changing prices within your market. And we identify a market as like a 10-mile radius. So if it was Max as a single operator, he could look at uh, the competition around his store up to 10 miles. Uh, the larger you know, area you're in, you may not want to go that large because at a 10 mile radius in Tampa, you would probably have 150 operators, you know, so you, you can scale that back and, and look at that data there. So, um, you know, just, uh, and then, like I said, everybody's a little different. Uh, some people want to have more hands on. So by us giving you the data, we're letting you make those decisions. Uh, if you go with a full on revenue management system, maybe Peter can speak, you know, more to that. And like he said, it's, I don't know if it actually does, do they actually make the rate changes for you then, Peter, or you again, assess the data and, and make the changes yourself? Uh, so there's a couple different approaches to that. And uh, if you're looking at the revenue management systems out there, uh, they have, uh, you know, you have uh, human interaction with one, and I think another one, uh, you can fully automate it. Uh, for me, I like having still that human interaction. That hands-on, uh, and that's yeah. what I hear from, you know, most operators from small to, you know, yeah. even large ones still want to know what's going on. Yeah, the control Absolutely. piece, yeah. 
Yeah, once once you're actually in there uh, getting your hands dirty with uh, all the data and not having uh, getting lost in it, uh, that's that can be a very tricky thing. That's true. Lost in all this data that we have and uh, making decisions that are not probably the best. Uh, I still do like having my uh, hands dirty when it comes to uh, getting in there and adjusting the rates. Yeah. How about you, Max? Well, I'm... Uh... As we as we go along, um, I'm lear learning more and more as uh, even as a single operator. Um, but uh, you know, I I enjoy lo uh, looking at the numbers. I enjoy um, f figuring it out. And as I, uh, as I stated earlier, I am uh, most of my units. I'm not the cheapest in the area. Um, and I try, uh, um, but I believe, I believe in what my, uh, what I have to offer my customer service and the features I offer compared to the store down the street who, uh, uh, built in the early seventies concrete and uh, concrete block walls. I mean, just, it, uh, it's an older, uh, older looking facility. The, uh, and the security and I, I really take pride in what uh, what I've got to um, uh, determine what my uh, what my rates are um, and I uh, I try to stay uh, stay on top of it that way and uh, and, I, and because I believe in my uh, my product I feel like I can and I I sort of tell my managers don't um, don't just think you can get uh, and people are in there price shopping because they want uh, they want to know their stuff safe, um, mm -hmm. and uh, that and that really helps and uh, that really helps a lot with the um, determining uh, the pricing you can get. For sure, and I think you know you you talked about it earlier is knowing your competition and not not that you're pricing exactly like them and that you know that you're uh, you know, maybe a little higher than them, but knowing what your competitive advantage is. And so, you know, definitely, um, you know, fortunately for you, you can actually go out and shop those properties. And I think that's invaluable that, you know, you do that every once in a while, but, um, you know, when life gets busy and your managers are running units, then that's where I think, you know, technology or automating some of this can, can help you, um, and gather that information for you. So you can see it with, you know, without having to, Technology is definitely your yeah. friend. Yeah. So. Yeah. And listen, I mean, our industry traditionally has been behind in technology. Here comes COVID-19. Everybody had to accelerate the process and get technology up to speed. And I, I would say with confidence that a lot of the technology companies that I know in the industry did a fantastic job getting it to where it needed to be. And there's still fine tweaking that needs to happen. But those that are not willing to adopt some of this technology, I truly believe you are going to be left behind in your operations. You've got to bring some of this into play um, it, because it, it I mean, just honestly, it just helps and it reduces man hours. It, it helps with operational efficiencies. Um, so why wouldn't you save on, you know, staffing and and labor. So we, we've talked a little bit about raising rates and I'm going to go back to this in a minute, but let's, we've got brand new tenants coming in every single month. What are, what's your strategy for setting your rates for your new tenants coming in? I'll go to you, Peter. Uh, so I guess it's a little bit a combination of not only just setting what the new rates are, but what specials are being utilized as moving. Sure. And we take a very fine uh, approach or very detailed approach and we measure and track everything on a month over month basis on uh, how many move-ins we got, how many specials were offered, what is the percentage of revenue lost based off those specials. And then we track and uh, try to maximize our revenue that way um, as well on new tenants. And so, uh, you know, I'm a big believer that, you know, a customer um, doesn't understand what is uh, common within our industry as far as a move-in special. Uh, they just want to feel like they got something. Uh, you know, if mm -hmm. you look at the retail world, uh, you, you walk through the mall, you'll see signs everywhere, 30% off, 40% off, uh, and try to drive people to come into the, the stores. Uh, they don't understand that 
you know, the first month free is a very common move and special for uh, our industry. Uh, they may uh, if offer, we may offer them 10% off the first uh, month and they feel good because they got a special, they got a deal and mm -hmm. uh, are able to move in. So when we track uh, move-ins and what specials uh, are given, we always work with the manager to set goals. So if that uh, property is giving away maybe 80% of the, the move-ins get a, a move-in special, uh, we try to set goals for less. Let's try to reduce that down to maybe 60% over the next three months. And out of those 60%, not only are were you giving 50% off the first month free, your primary uh, move-in special, let's try to move that to 25% off the first month. And so we set these small little goals for our property managers and makes a significant impact on the bottom line. Uh, and you, you'll be surprised on how the property managers uh, actually are able to do it and not lose rentals and keep their conversion ratio up to our, our standards and to our goals uh, by setting these small little increments. Uh, so they're not going from, hey, you know, you offered 80% of the move-ins, a move-in special. I want you to move that down to 5%. That's a huge jump. And they'd be worried that they're going to lose uh, move-ins. But if you do it on a small uh, scale and baby steps, it's actually an achievable goal. And we've had a lot of success with that. That's awesome. How about you, Max? I, um, if, if you come in off the streets, you will not get any discounts at Gate 5. If you go through our website, you've got um, uh, different special, uh, different move-in specials, um, and I I do that to sort of help stress. Um, once you register, rent the unit through uh, through our website, you'll be able to pay your bill through our website. You'll be able to do everything, and not um, not even come in and see and uh, see a manager there have been times um that i have been uh recently since i lost my part-time manager that i've been working remotely so the office is completely closed so i'm what i'm trying to do is force people to go to uh, go to my website and i've had several months where my website has done more rentals than my man uh, than my manager but if you come in the office right now, you will not get any sort of discount um, mm -hmm. with uh, and I, I uh, let me correct myself with the exception of a military discount, because we are right by the military base. Um, other than that, we uh, and uh, we uh, uh, we used to um, towards the end of last year say, well, Jess, um, I, uh, I can give it to you and give you uh this unit for a hundred dollars but if you go through our website you can get it for uh 50 off so uh why don't you here's the ipad why don't you go ahead and fill it out i've stopped doing that all together mm -hmm. and um so uh come in the office no discount go through our website you'll have uh, you'll have a discount and it has worked it has worked beautifully and to kind of back up what max says we we take it an approach where we have a good better best pricing at our property mm -hmm. so uh, 10 by 10 and all the way in the back corner is the one that we advertise online uh that's our lowest price for a 10 by 10 uh then we have a better and a best pricing and uh when the somebody walks in they don't get the the, the cheapest price uh on the first uh pitch you know and so we we have roughly about a 37 percent upgrade from uh the lowest uh tiered unit uh to the highest tiered and so when okay. somebody walks in, uh, they're going to be getting uh, the higher priced unit on a street rate. And it can be up to 20% higher than what we advertise online. So maybe a unit's 100 bucks online, uh, and we're going to be showing them the one that's $120. If they push back on the pricing, then we have room to go. So we're able to uh, say, hey, well, you know, we can get you one a little bit cheaper, but it's going to be in the back corner, maybe not properly lit, well, as well as uh, the rest of it. Maybe it's farther away from the elevator. Uh, those type of things. Um, but we definitely charge the walk-ins a lot more. Yeah. And that, that actually is going to bring me to my next question. We'll touch, you're touching on it already, but we'll expand on it. Should the convenience of the unit play a role in the pricing strategy? Absolutely. 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 Delta does, right? Delta does that uh, on <laughs> VIP on their first class. <laughs> That's right. You have yeah. coach, you have Delta plus, and then you have first class. And uh, yeah. each one has different features, right? The Delta class, uh, 
Comfort Plus has a little bit more leg room and you get free drinks and free snacks and uh, first class is first class. So there's uh, a lot of differences uh, in convenience and uh, lighting. We recently started doing smart units too with a company called Storage Defender. So uh, there's a lot of different things that you can add as benefits to an individual unit and set them apart uh, versus just saying, hey, 10 by 10 is a 10 by 10. Yeah, for sure. It's interesting. I um, Everybody's familiar with Track T buildings. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Track T. Uh, it's Jamie, I think his name is, that runs it. Um, he does those seminars and he had one here in Jacksonville and he asked for me to come by because I sit on the board for the Florida Association. He needed someone to speak about the association. So I went, but he showed, um, he showed data from 2018, 2019, 2020, and 2021. And the shift you saw from like call-ins, walk-ins to websites, I mean, it's almost kind of come like full mm -hmm. circle. Um, so good responsive websites, like you're talking about Max, you know, they come in, they're not getting a discount, but if they go to your website, they could get that discount. So anything to maybe drive the rentals. Um, and, I mean, people are just inherently going to websites. People, consumers don't want to interact with humans anymore. Uh, the digital era is really taking that element away. They want it on their phone. They want to do it instantaneous and they don't want to talk to a human in the process. So it is very critical to have um, a website in place that is responsive that can either do the online reservation or full out online rental. I mean, that's the, that's the, the prime. That's the goal, one. right? That's the goal one there. To, do for the sure. dent to get the rental. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I look at it as different channels and different people's perspective. Uh, yeah. Uh, if you think about it, my one of my buddies, uh, like if I try to call him, uh, he'll never answer the phone, but I'll get a text immediately and say, hey, man, what's up? <laughs> Right? So I do the to, same thing. You want to communicate via, via text uh, and yeah. not over the phone. My mom's different. She preferred to talk to me over the phone versus texting. I, I have friends who rather email than uh, text or phone. Uh, and I have other people who love just me in person. And the same approach uh, we have is we want to open up every avenue or every mm -hmm. channel that a customer could want to interact with us. And we want to do business the way they want to do business with us, not the way we want to do business with them. And having a online presence that they're able to complete the whole transaction online, I think it's absolutely huge for that specific type of uh, market or sure. that consumer. There's a lot of people who still love walking into uh, the local place because maybe they drove by. That's a different type of consumer. And having different approaches to each one of those on a revenue, ma revenue management side, I think is absolutely key. I can tell you what, I am the best tenant possible. I haven't <laughs> set foot in my unit in three years. I honestly should purge every single box that's in there because it's probably all doesn't fit me anymore. No, it's worth anything. it. It's worth it. <laughs> I, know, right? I mean, they got you're, me good. You're the good I'm, tenant. I'm on auto pay. I have, they will never overlock me because I'm on auto pay. And go. like I said, I have not stepped foot in that unit in three years. I couldn't even tell you what's in that unit anymore. But for some reason, psychologically and emotionally, whatever's in there, I'm not ready to let go of yet, <laughs> clearly, because it still sits three years later. So, yeah, I totally agree. Like, because, you know, listen, my 90 year old grandfather certainly isn't going to, he doesn't even have a smartphone. We couldn't even get him to figure out a flip <laughs> phone. So he's not going to rent on a website, right? right. Yeah. He's going to probably want to go tour it, see it, touch it, feel it. It's it's a mind shift difference in, in the generations or even, you know, just how you like to operate for sure. So yeah, but I'm, I'm definitely not that one. Um, Jim Mooney asked a question. I, I'm going to direct this over to you, Peter, because I think you use Veritech. Anyone using Veritech or any other value pricing programs? Yeah, so we use Veritech on our starting rates uh, and uh, we find it very beneficial for us. There's uh, some other ones out there like ProRise is another one uh, if you're looking to mm -hmm. kind of compare and contrast. Each of them have a very unique approach to uh, the way they uh, handle things. So Veritech has the good, better, best pricing um, module that I think I, we find the most value out of that uh, just because it really uh, helps uh, add a lot of money on the margin uh, to, to what we do. Um, and I think ProRise is a more that automated uh, approach where they do a lot of forecasting and uh, saying, hey, if you have, you know, uh, 10, 10 by 10s, they think eight of them are going to be vacant. So uh, they're going to lower the rate to help uh, offset that occupancy. Uh, something that, uh, you know, it's a different approach than what we uh, kind of like, but 
Uh, that's why we use Vera Tech and not, not ProRise. Cool. Thanks for that. Uh, let's talk about this real quick. So we raise the rates and we have an unhappy tenant. Max, how do you train your managers to deal with those unhappy tenants that are just not willing to make a budge for whatever percent you raised it? What, how, do you, how do you guard your managers to kind of combat those unhappy tenants that come to you? Oh, all my tenants are, just love me when I raise their <laughs> rates. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, um, uh, the, uh, one of the first things I do is I raise my street rates before I raise my tenant rates. And, um, and then when I send out my rate increase letters to my tenants and they come back and um, complain, uh, uh, Jess, you call me up and you say, hey, um, you know, times are tough. Um, I lost my job, whatever the case may be. And it, uh, I can't handle this $15 um, rate increase. I was like, hey, Jess, I completely understand. Um, uh, why, don't, uh, why don't we just cut it down to $10? Okay, that's fine. Good. I'm not getting my $15 that I want, but I've got, you, uh, I've got a rate increase of at least $10. Um, I'll, uh, and um, so we, uh, we break down. Uh, I, tell my man, uh, I tell my managers, listen to their argument and don't, don't be a softy and say, sorry, um, you're not, we'll just not do that rate increase. Um, knock a, maybe knock a couple of dollars off where they're still getting a rate increase, just not as high as you possibly want it. But it's low, and they feel like they've gotten something on you. So they're negotiating with you. Negotiating. <laughs> Jody, when you were operating, how did you equip your managers to combat those uh, angry tenants? <laughs> uh, I, can't, I agree with Max that like, if you change your, your board rates uh, or your standard rates first, uh, it helps your managers understand the the spread of the difference. So you know sometimes it's a five dollar rate increase on the same size unit could be a ten or a twenty dollar rate increase on the same size unit. But you're showing them that you know this really this unit is valued at a hundred dollars and this person's only paying eighty. So we have to you know have some kind of a rate increase here. Um, and then exactly what Max said, you've got to listen to the customer first, understand you know their needs, what they're going through. Um, sometimes uh, you know there there might not be any room for flexibility but if there is to change by a couple dollars and the other thing we used to do is point out uh, maybe some kind of improvements that have been done to the facility so That's you know yep. now we have a brand new gate or a new keypad or you know we've added this feature or that feature and that's really you know uh, helping you and and justifies the cost of the raise that we're not just you know going to buy lunch today, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I know Universal Storage Group always has like fresh baked cookies in their offices. So I'll be like, well, you get fresh baked cookies there at our facility. Go. So shove a, you shove should a be cookie paying, in their mouth. <laughs> you should be paying that rent increase. <laughs> How about you, Peter? Uh, we use the same approach as like Max and, and Jody. I think it's a, a very standard thing. If uh, you want to be the person that uh, helps them with that rate increase versus saying, hey, you have to shove it down their throat and you know uh you just got to take it so if they push back then maybe you cut the the rate in half or you know knock a couple bucks off to kind of work with them on it and they feel like they got a win out of it as well and uh exactly what jody said on the, the improvements around the property you know that's a great way to kind of say hey this is why we need to do this um you know but that only goes so far and you only can use that <laughs> excuse uh, right. so often <laughs> yeah. so you know and also we, we raise rates to 100 street rates and we try to, you know, raise the tenants rates up to get to it. But we have a lot of properties that we have tenant rates higher than our street higher. rates. And so uh, having that approach too of, uh, you know, not really bringing up your street rates is, is an important one for us as well, because if they do, they may know that they're paying more than what our street rate is. And uh, what we only say in those scenarios is, well, those people who move in at the lower rate, that's an, an industrial rate and will eventually get them up to where you're currently at. And uh, or if they really want to, you know, uh, push back, it's like, well, uh, I'm more than happy to change your rate whenever I change the rate on this unit type. Uh, so whether that goes up or down, 
your rate changes. And they're like, no, no, I, I really don't want that, you know? And so, you know, they, they rather have something stable, um, but that giving them that win by negotiating it down with them, uh, it's huge. And if you don't ask for a, a higher rate, you never know if you're going to get it. So yeah. our big believer in only sending out the rate increases, no matter what, uh, if they're paying over the street rate or not. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the other thing, I recently redid uh, my lease and I added a clause to it, a, a loss of discount clause that when the um, customer, when the customer is uh, 30 days past due, they, um, they immediately, without notice, jump to standard rate. It has helped my uh, delinquencies because I've got a lot of people paying a date that are typically um, late, they pay at day 29 just to avoid having their rate jump up to mm -hmm. the standard rate. And um, it's, part, it's part of my contract. We point um, my lease agreement and we point it out when they rent the unit. And um, it, has def it has definitely helped. Do you have anything like that, Peter, where they lose the discounts or concessions that were given to them originally if they don't pay on time? No, and uh, we we typically just uh, keep to the standard of uh, we're a month to month contract, and so we give mm -hmm. them a month notice prior to any type of change uh, in rate. Got it. So we touched on this. I think Peter, you said it earlier. Rate increases. You know, new tenant comes in, maybe it increase at nine months, and then after that, on like an annualized basis. Are there any anybody else heard any of the different theories out there? I mean, I've heard six months, four months. I've heard all kinds of stuff, and I know it. It's I've done dependent. all. Have you <laughs> talk me, talk so me through it? It really does depend on the property, and each property sure. is different. And uh, so I've, I've done four months uh, rate increases and it's been very successful with it. Uh, I've had other properties where we got a lot of pushback from it. So we had to uh, change our strategy. So it really does depend on the property and uh, how aggressive you want to get and uh, what you're willing to do. Yeah. Jim Mooney says, we have it stipulated in our lease summary that if they do not pay on time, they lose their moving concession. So it sounds like similar to what you're doing uh, there, Max, a little bit. Um, it, it's, aside from the companies that we talked about, like Jody, StoreTrack, PriorEyes, Veritech, if somebody needs some good revenue management strategies and resources, where would you suggest that they go look for that? I think reaching out to us is a good one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I, I think if you, you search, uh, there's been so many articles written uh, about revenue management. ISS has a lot of great articles. Uh, SSA mm -hmm. has good blogs and newsletters about it. Uh, I think there's a significant amount of resources out there uh, to get you off the ground. And, uh, you know, if you want to get even more into it, read a lot of psychology books on pricing strategies and pricing theory. Uh, I'm kind of a, a weirdo with that. I, I, I'm, I love reading those books. Uh, and... We yeah. use uh, pricing psychology and how we approach our street rates as well. And it's been a very effective uh, method for us. So there's a lot that you can do out there. There's uh, a lot of resources for sure. Yeah, we have we have a, another division that we work with um, in the cannabis industry and our partners in that love like the Walmart strategy, ending pricing in seven and the psychology mm -hmm. around that. Like yeah, that's called charm, uh, charm pricing and prestige pricing. So charm pricing is where it ends in a nine. Yep. Uh, prestige pricing is where it ends in a uh, five zero. Uh, and if you go, there's a uh, won't get too far into this, but uh, there's a perception of value when it comes to charm pricing and prestige pricing. If you go to a fancy restaurant, you'll never see a menu item ending in, the, in a nine. A nine has a value proposition or a discounted proposition. So a fancy restaurant does not want to equate their food to discount food or McDonald's. Sure. Uh, if you have McDonald's, you have a 99 cent menu. Right. Yeah. And it's it's a perception of value uh, and quality as well. So there's a, a lot of different things that go into uh, it. And it's if you ever want to know more resources or books, read, uh, reach out to me. I'm, I'm happy to share. Them. What was the book you just shared a minute ago, Peter? I'm going to put it in the chat. Uh, there's one called Priceless. Priceless. Yep. I forgot who the author is, but that's one of my favorite books. On uh, We'll find it. Technology. 
Awesome. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I do listen. I mean, the seven works because I go in and I'm like, it's 497, 497. It's not quite $500. Right. <laughs> it's $497. Well, it has a four handle on it. It, it has, in your mind, you think 400, uh, you're not thinking 500. And, you're not. Uh, so it depends. So if you're uh, setting your prices, what if you set it at 475, you're losing $25. Why not set it at 499? Right. It's the right. same price psychology uh, to a person who's buying. Yeah, and there there is a whole psychology behind this, right? I mean, there just is. It's the way the human brain and body works. So we've got a couple more minutes. Audience, if you have any questions for our panelists today, please enter those now. Um, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, I'm just going to go over some stuff that's coming up. So we will be in Vegas next week at ISS. You can come visit the SBOA at Lucky Booth number 333. I didn't realize that when I picked the booth number. And then after the fact, I'm like, oh, my God, all the marketing stuff I could do with this. <laughs> like, I mean, it's just out of control. But Peter, with Call Potential, give us the rundown. You guys will be there. Do you know your booth? Are you guys speaking at all? Uh, I do not know my booth. I probably should. It's uh, okay. I don't but, either, uh, Peter. I was like, she's going to uh, ask me next. I'm like, I don't know. Like, just look for, it's okay. Look for the booth that has a bunch of blue and some TVs. Uh, that's Lots that's TVs. Us. So we, uh, we always rent a large booth. And uh, happy to talk with everyone if anyone's at the ISS. Swing by the Call Potential booth. Uh, love to meet you. Awesome. Jody, how about you? Uh, we'll be in Vegas also. Uh, the store track booth and list self storage will be with us. Uh, sorry, I don't know my booth number either. Um, we just rolled out a new effective uh, rate uh, tool that's part of our, our optimized platform that we didn't really get to talk about much here with revenue management, but uh, taking into consideration like that promotion or that discount and how much rent you get over uh, that time uh, when you look at the different discounting that you use. And then on our Explorer side, which is acquisitions and development, uh, we have a new market discovery tool that's going to help uh, search for new properties. So um, we'll, be, uh, we'll be introducing that at ISS and look forward to having everybody and anybody stop by. Look at your team saving 422, your guys. Uh, I, know. Is, uh, I definitely know it, and it's 422. Nice. <laughs> well, I was I was trying to pull up the SBOA website because we always do our version of a show guide. It's a more condensed version, and you guys are partners of ours, so we have it somewhere. If you go to the SBOA website and you go to our news section, read the ISS guide. It has um, all of our partners and where their booths will be. Are either of your groups speaking? I'm speaking, so let me toss this up here on the screen. Nice. Um, and please don't come to my session. Um, <laughs> yeah, you just <laughs> now she does. She come. does a good job. I don't know, but I'm talking about. Um, it'll be. Oh, that's the wrong. Oh, I put the wrong banner up here, and I put the wrong banner up again. Look, I'm really failing over here. Too many banners. Here we go. <laughs> Wednesday, April 20th at 1 p.m. Hiring services for your self storage business. How to choose and vet vendors and negotiate like a pro. We do this all day, every day on the SBOA side. Uh, we're talking to vendor partners that we've used previously for the portfolio that we used to own. We don't own any properties anymore currently, but looking to buy again here uh, in the near future. Um, but please feel free to stop by. But no, Jody, Peter, no one's got table talks, nothing happening? Um, no, not this uh, time. Okay. Uh, I think like you said we kind of do more SSA on the on the operation side. So with, with ISS, not so much. Got it. Now, Jody, give us a quick rundown. I know you did, said you didn't get to mention Optimize that much, but go ahead and tell us a little bit more about that program as we wrap up today. Yeah, I think Optimize probably fits in with a lot of uh, the SBOA members, maybe more small to, to medium operators, uh, although we, we, you know, we have small, medium and large operators and REITs uh, clients. Uh, so, um, but Optimize is a visual platform. So, very easy to use. And again, you know, for the small operator and probably even Max, like you want to log in, you want to see all that data, you get to see graphs, you get to see charts, you get to see uh, it by unit type and the history over the last 12 months. Uh, we also have a marketing scorecard. And so we kind of touched on that today too, about how important it is with your website and your e-commerce uh, kind of overview in the market. So it really does a lot of comparison and how your websites, website stacks up against the competition in your market. So not the, again, that you have to have the same price or the same rank, but just so you know that, you know, 
if they're able to reserve and rent units uh, that you want to be able to do that too. And, uh, you know, do they have, uh, there's different things in there that show uh, your call availability. So do you, you know, do you have your 800 number posted on your website or do you have a chat? So there's different things that uh, takes it into consideration, but it really does all your market analysis for you and kind of provi provides it in one visual platform so that you don't have to spend all the time doing it and the and the rates are updated uh, daily for you. And again, like the this monthly subscription for Optimize, you rent one to two units, it pays for it pretty much, right? Yeah, am I allowed to throw a price out there? You, want me to... um, you go for it. Yeah, <laughs> this, this, the because world is that, your oyster. <laughs> actually, I think SBOA uh, clients get it for $44 a month. Uh, so if you uh, belong to the SBOA, it's $44 a month. It is per store. Um, but like you said, most a five by five unit rents for more than $44 a month now. So Way um, more, you yeah. rent one more unit and it pays for itself. And you have all those insights to help you make these decisions, whether it's revenue management or just understanding your market and your, your, um, you know, surrounding competition. Yeah. I'll be hey, calling you after I. All uh, right, Max. <laughs> we got one sale today. Yeah. There you go. Hey, I do have, we're going to go over just slightly by a couple minutes. I apologize, audience and my speakers, but I do have two questions now from the audience and I want to toss those in. So Pamela Owens is asking, how do you guys handle tenants who go into lean process, but pay out and go back in again and again, non-renewal? Question. Uh, we enjoy them. <laughs> yeah, take, no, take no, the money I, and run. I, I, keep I, I take it. Auction fees and let them keep going. Yeah, for sure. That's a good rent increase uh, tenant right there. You can raise them up to $1,000 and then if they don't pay it, you know, uh, <laughs> you can uh, evict them. <laughs> Max, what, Max, what were you going to say? How do no, you I, uh, um, I, I enjoy... Uh, I enjoy those type tenants and I cut the locks and it's funny when we open up the unit, we already had the inventory of what's in the unit and there's just a stack of cut locks thrown and because we <laughs> cut the locks and just toss them in uh, inside the unit. And uh, most I've had were six locks in one unit um, before they finally said the heck with it. I give. Oh goodness. And then this is going to piggyback on that. Donna McDonald is saying, how do you get them out? Many people continue to play the game until they are caught and end up auction. And, and the other thing, I know this isn't exactly it, but to make sure that, you know, your lease outlines a lot of this to say what's going to happen to them and that you have good late fees and auction fees in there, because, you know, if you're not collecting those fees for all the work that you're doing, then it's probably not worth it. Um, but uh, just like uh, we just said, it's like, if you, if you are collecting that, then your that tenant now isn't a hundred dollar a month unit. Now they're more like $300 a month from all, all the fees that you have. So for you sure. exactly. pretty much just, have, um, have a lease in place. Yeah, and make sure and make sure you uh, you make and the big thing is make sure you follow your lease. And a lot of uh, a lot of the different states um, have state approved leases. So, for gosh sakes, everybody, join your state association. I can't uh, I can't bang my head against the wall enough following people on social media. Um, hey, who has a copy of such and such state lease? And it's like, no, just suck it up, pay the money and, uh, um, but fo uh, follow your state lease. May, uh, and as Jody said, make sure you have noted and documented in your lease, the different, um, uh, fees that you do pay and do have to, um, charge or that you do charge, uh, for the delinquents when they go and enjoy, the and enjoy those customers. They will get sold sooner or later. Um, <laughs> Or so, it, if they drive you crazy, you know, maybe uh, work out uh, work out a deal with them. Say, yeah. I'm I'm sick and tired and uh, tired of you doing this. Let's um, just pay this much and get out. Just leave, so I can get someone that will be consistent. For sure. Yeah, and if you're doing those deals with them, I'd highly recommend getting a release signed by them. Uh, if, yes. Uh, <laughs> That way, you everything's kind of buttoned up legally. Um, but mm -hmm. I would only say too, if you're going to do a deal with a, a tenant, 
uh, when they show up to the, the property, make sure they have a U-Haul or they have a Penske truck, uh, something that uh, the deal happens that day and they have to remove the contents of that unit that day. So they don't make a payment and then all of a sudden like, oh yeah, we give you three or four days to, to move out. Right. Well, and they, they just made a payment may have to reset the auction process and uh, kind of screw things up for you. So I uh, highly recommend a release and they uh, require that they show up with a, a moving truck or a bunch of friends and a pickup truck. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Great insight on this topic. I'm going to remove you guys from screen real quick because I've got a couple of remaining announcements. Again, thanks everyone for being here. A pleasure seeing all of you. All right, everyone, we're going to wrap this up. A couple quick announcements. We are live, like I said, in Vegas next week. The SBOA will be at booth number 333. When we come back, the week after, join us Thursday, April 28th at 2 p.m. for another self-storage unlock. This one is real estate transactions, how to contribute to a successful close. I'm actually putting up the correct banners this time, which is good. Um, and then we also have another quick announcement. Save the date. The SBOA June virtual conference will be on June 1st. And June 2nd, both days, the event is from 1 to 5.30, all online in the similar platform that we're here today. Uh, we'll be releasing the registration information very soon. And I'm going to close out with a quick video of our new program, so stay tuned. All right, if you are a newer owner operator in the self-storage industry or looking to be an investor or know someone that is, the SBOA has created a new edu educational program called Storage for Rookies. You can go to storageforrookies.com to learn more about it. Our next event is Thursday, May the 12th, and I believe it is from 12 to 5, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, but you can go online and check that out. And the SBOA was born from a group called Storage Pros Management. Um, storage pros management owned, built, acquired, sold a portfolio of close to or over 100 locations over the past 20 some odd years. So we've been around doing this for a long time and we consider ourselves pretty seasoned experts in the space. Um, and we've gathered some of the top industry experts to talk to you about how to get in the industry and be successful in the early stages of the process. So storageforrookies.com. Happy Thursday, everyone. Have a great Easter weekend. I keep forgetting that Easter is this Sunday. We'll see you in Vegas next week if you're in Vegas. If not, we'll see you back here in two weeks virtually, April 28th at 2 p.m. Have a great rest of your day. Take care.